we're exploring the consequences of the changing workforce. So as jobs change, skills change, the location of the work may change, how do we help organizations? What, how should organizations address whether there is a workforce out there that can do that work? The session's called Deep Dive, because we're going to explore things in some detail. Deep Dive into shallow talent pools, because often the challenge is shifting the workforce when actually we don't quite know whether the talent exists to make that shift. To guide us through this discussion, two colleagues are coming to join us. Um, there's Luzia Fink. Uh, Luzia is one of our new friends inside Mercer. She, uh, she joined Mercer through ProMerit joining Mercer, so it's going to be really interesting to see uh, Luzia, and uh, David Osborne, who's been with Mercer for many, many years. So Lu I can't see where you are, but Luzia and David, please, please come and join me. That's right. Come on. Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody, and hello, Lisbon. Just want to say that it's been a great session this morning, and we're really looking forward to sharing our stories with you. So there's going to be two parts of today's presentation. I'm going to do the more high-level storytelling part, and my colleague, Lucia, is really going to go into the detail and really show you in practical terms and practical examples of how companies can streamline their operations to really start thinking about strategic talent sourcing. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, so also very warm welcome from my side. Um, let's see, I think I'm manager at Promerit, and um, my story will be um, a project case we did together with Infineon, and it's about their new talent acquisition strategy, but more in a few minutes. And what's really cool about her presentation is it's one of the only presentations I've seen where you can actually showcase a tangible return on investment for the initiatives that have been undertaken. So hopefully my bit will be good too, but Lucia's is really good. Yeah? <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. So we're gonna set the scene, we're gonna talk a little about digitization, the arrival of the fourth industrial revolution and what this means for companies. We're then gonna look at some best practices and lessons that we've learned in a recent project. Uh, we conducted a European digital talent availability study with over 60 leading companies within Europe. And we're going to group together six of these best practices in two areas. One is the external, so we're going to look at the external environment, and we're also going to look at the internal environment. Then we're going to move over, as we said, to the case study. So I think this kind of reflects kind of the discussions that we've been having earlier this morning. Change is coming. If you look at disruption and you look at the changes that can happen to organizations' business models, disruption can come from anywhere. This presentation has three quotes in it, that's all. But there's two here, so please take your time to read them. And what I think is of extreme interest is I was at a global banking summit two weeks ago, and I had all the big banks there, HSBC, Barclays, Credit Suisse, and not one of them were looking at each other as being a challenger bank. They were all concerned about Facebook, Amazon, Google. What happens if these tech companies start going into consumer lending and credit lending. <clears throat> so you can see there, the discussions that they're having is not about financial services, it's really about the tech companies and the fintech companies that aren't on their radar. But this isn't new. This isn't new, change isn't new. If you look at the origins of species, and this is the last quote, Darwin said, it's not the most intelligent or the strongest, it's the most adaptable to change. And I think that really resonates well in the business environment in which we're all working in today. So companies have two choices. They can either embrace change or they can get left behind. And to what extent companies will get left behind, only time will tell. But one thing is for certain, digitization, automation will impact all of the different areas of your value chain. The way you work with your employees, the way that you think about new ideas and products, the way that your infrastructure is developed, it will impact it. But what we do know for certain, and again, this has been repeated, I think, within the keynotes, is that it will lay, all these changes will change the way we work, the jobs we need to do, and the skills needed to fulfill those jobs. 
But this is my one thing, shout out. This is a digital conference. But if you look here, the future skills are not just digital. It's also about the human side, the cognitive capabilities, complex problem solving. This was from the World Economic Forum report. I think it was 2017. I know they had a 2018 report. But you can see here the demand for skills. Aside from process and technical skills, the rest really are about the human emotional intelligence side of things. So the most successful teams will incorporate both, both digital and experts who have these capabilities. But there is one thing that was quite funny. In terms of preparation for this session, I did some research. I did uh, a little bit of a, looking through the academic literature. And I came across two reports which kind of showcases the uncertainty that we're all experiencing. No one really knows what's going to happen. I think that's illustrated very well in these two quotes. So back in 2013, Oxford University released quite a controversial publication or academic paper which said 47% of jobs in the US and 35% in the UK were at high risk of being automated. Policymakers, people in businesses, of course, it's a wake-up call. Everyone's in shock mode. Fast forward five years into the future, the OECD does another peer review, and they come up with 10% and 12%. Those are massive discrepancies. What I'm trying to say here is, yes, change will happen, but who knows if we do the same study next year, if it's 5 and 7%, who knows? All we know is that it is going to come. But there is one question that I'm going to ask you all. It's about automation, so please take out your app things. <laughs> My question to you is, what will the impact be of automation on, glob on jobs globally? Will A, 35 million jobs be displaced, B, 55 million jobs, C, 75 million jobs, or D, 95 million jobs? So go. Seconds seems a long way, isn't it? You're waiting. <laughs> Has everyone done it? Okay, well, let's see what you got. 55 million jobs. Well, I hate to tell you, you're all wrong. <laughs> the people who said 75 million jobs are correct. But what I want to say here is look, automation, everyone talks about doom and gloom of automation. But did you know that last month, the World Economic Forum, there you go, there's the answer, came up with this statement. Yes, 75 million jobs will be replaced, but 133 million new ones will be created, which is a net positive. So it's not all doom and gloom. And I sometimes think in the press and everything, we always talk about the, you know, are we going to be replaced? You know, chances are next year we'll all still be here. You're not all going to be replaced by robots, yeah, hopefully. But one thing that we do know, even though there's uncertainty about the change, to what extent is it going to impact businesses, leading companies are already preparing for eventual disruption, and they're focusing on two things, the external environment and the internal environment. As I mentioned in my introduction, I'll be presenting six best practices that these companies are doing. So take notes. Maybe you can learn something here. Uh, and a little shout out, this is merely the tip of the iceberg. We've got a comprehensive analysis and research into what keeps digital talents engaged, how do you retain them, what channels do you need to use to source them. So if you're interested, please reach out and I'll send you the, the full report. So, the external environment. What is the external environment? The definition we have here, these are factors which no one company can control. These are socio-economic trends, political trends, technological advancements. These are things that companies need to react to. But leading companies are preparing by monitoring the external environment. And let's see what they're doing. I think everybody's seen this before. What we've seen is leading companies from our research, they're not just writing down in paper, oh, we have all these different talent pools that we can tap into. They're really putting these things into practice. So they're moving away from paper exercise and really mapping out the ecosystems in which they operate to figure out 
what are the talent pools that are available to us so that we can tap into them at the right time and at the right cost, which will benefit us and our customers. And leading companies are using lots of technological solutions and platforms out there to improve the customer journey. And there's one company which has been done a very good job, and I've got a little case study for you. So this is IKEA. I think everybody knows IKEA. So this is an example of a company that's taken it to the next level. So they've realized that they have 160,000, I believe it was, uh, freelancers in the US and the UK alone who work on design, uh, the on uh, after sales, like if you buy a couch or a cupboard you need to get it put together, someone from Ikea can come and do it, or you can get a third party to do it. But what they've realized is, if they group together and collect information about all of these contractors and put them inside an internal database, which they call TaskRabbit, and they allow their customers to directly tap into the database. Customers can go into TaskRabbit, and they can say, for instance, I need my cupboard. Someone needs to put my cupboard together. It's a very bad example, but that's one of the things you do with IKEA. You can go in, and you can find a contractor who doesn't work for IKEA. You can find out their hourly rates. You can find out their location. You can find out their feedback scores. And what does this mean? It means that IKEA can now tap into this talent pool. It saves them in terms of their overhead costs because it's not a fixed employee. And for their customers, it means that they can go in, choose a freelancer that matches their needs within their budget with a certain appraisal. So the conclusion here is leading companies are not just mapping it out. They're really managing all those different talent pools. So that's one. The second thing that they're doing is really working with the business. So if you look at HR, HR is really working with the business to identify what are the trends and forces that are going to impact our organization moving forward. And they're planning for these changes. They may say, we need new data scientists, a 1,000 data scientists in three years' time, or cybersecurity, or whatever it may be. But what they're doing is they're using workforce metrics and analytics and information. This is all from our research study, by the way, on the supply and demand of talent within given markets. And the reason why that's important is because this information will allow you to build your, or facilitate your discussions regarding build versus buy versus borrow. So if you can track the market and you can identify the demand for skills, that obviously gives you insights into competition that could increase the cost for that skill in the future. This is real data, and look over a 12-month period, the number of job postings went from 900 for data scientists to 2,200. So these are considerable jumps, and if you just look at other metrics, like new hire rates, it shows demand for these skills. But that's only one part of the equation, because demand and supply go together. So what we did within our study is did an assessment of how much talent is there in specific markets with these skills at this moment in time. And I think the value of this is showcased in this one graph. We were quite surprised, to be honest, at the number of cloud engineers in Berlin. If you compare that to London, which is far bigger economically in terms of population size and economic powerhouse, you would think London would be in the lead. That is not true. So one, map out and monitor. Two, supply and demand. Forecast the demand for skills in your business and map out how they will change moving forward. And the third one, then I'll go on to the internal, is looking at your location strategy. Do the operations or the locations in which we have operations, are they fit for purpose? Do they support our future people, operational needs, business needs? And here we see organizations doing assessments of their current locations, not just on labor availability, supply and demand, but looking at political and regulatory environments, infrastructure. You could have a great digital strategy, but if you're based somewhere where there's internet, connecti internet connectivity issues, that could be a challenge in the future. So these are the three things that we've seen in the external environment. And as I said, in our report, we showcase how companies are managing this and how they monitor it. Again, this is only the, the tip of the iceberg. How am I doing for time? Okay, you've still got time. Um, 
So let's now look on the internal factors. And again, this is where it links your case study, because you go into far more detail here. These are things that you can directly influence. So mechanisms and tools that you have at your disposal to start managing talent. Step number one. Again, someone told me this is a really old graph. We've had it in Mercer for years and years, but it's fit for purpose. Um, you won't believe it, but you can't plan for the future if you don't know what your company looks like today. I know it sounds so self-explanatory, but so many companies don't even know what their current talent flows look like. So how are you supposed to plan for the future if you don't know what your business looks like today? So I don't know if everybody knows this. This is an internal labor map. It shows how talent goes into your system. That's in green. It shows you how talent is promoted. That's in blue. And on the right-hand side, it shows turnover. If you're planning for the future, leading companies and map out and they understand their current workforce and workflows. Because if you don't fix the problems within your system now, good luck in the future. So that's one. The second thing, and again, I'm sure everybody has a retention strategy. What we've seen is for digital talents, again, this was from the research for cybersecurity and data scientists, we saw that retention was not only cash driven. So we've seen that for digital talents, technological experts, they're really looking at career path development, personal development, ongoing learning, continuous learning, whatever you want to call it, digital talents want to make sure that they are at the cutting edge of their sector so they're more employable for their next gig and so they stay up with the market. So this is something which we found which was quite compelling. We've talked about flexible work as well this morning. Uh, that was obviously something that came up as well. And this is my last one. You cannot buy all of the talents that you need. And I think this is something, firstly, you may not have the budget, there may not be the supply. So you need to maximize the talents that you already have within your organization. And again, what you can see here, this was the example of the case study of Berlin, uh, included within the report. What we've seen companies do is, okay, you can upskill and reskill your employees to fill the future needs of your business. But how can you go about doing that? And what we always say is, look for quick wins, look for plausible and easy reskilling paths. So again, what we see companies doing is they say, okay, we may need data scientists. Let's reverse engineer the process and figure out what are the career paths that people follow in order to become these experts in the external environments. Then look within our business to find out who has those raw capabilities and skills, and then create tailored learning and development initiatives in order to bridge that gap. So to summarize, I'm not gonna go through all of this, it'll take too long. Companies are really managing their talent ecosystems they're looking at maximizing what they already have. They're using external data to foster their discussions about build versus buy versus borrow. And really working and looking towards the future to see how their business will change and what this means for their operations and talent needs in the future. So hopefully this has given you a little warm up. Um, Lucia is now going to go into the case study, which is awesome. So over to you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, David, um, for that interesting presentation and for raising the expectations to my presentation. Um, yeah, so um, what I'd like to do um, in the next um, 20 minutes, I'd like to introduce um, a customer case um, we did together with um, Infineon. And um, first of all, who of you knows Infineon? Just raise your hands. All right, <laughs> so um, I think it's worth to explain about uh, the background uh, of Infineon. Um, that would be my first uh, topic of, of the presentation. Um, afterwards, I want to introduce you to what we did. So we um, created uh, with them a new talent acquisition strategy. So we um, worked together with them how to bring the future talents into, um, into Infineon. And um, the last chapter will be about the results and the yeah, um, KPIs um, we, we could achieve. 
So yeah, let's get started. Um, Infineon at a glance. So Infineon um, is a German, Germany-based company, um, and it's in the semiconductor business. And what they do um, is more or less um, microcontrollers and microchips. So, um, and um, they are yeah in four business segments. So um, they deal with the automotive industry, industrial power, power management, and also the chip card industry. And um, yeah, with the, uh, what, what the workforce is about, they um, have about uh, 37,000 employees. And um, they are an international company um, and are spread in Europe, Asia, and uh, also in the US. And um, what's really interesting, they are, um, um, from the standpoint of market position, they are really number one in the power market um, and also in the security business. And um, what's really interesting um, is the financial part. When you have a look at the revenue um, and the margin, it really increased um, the last couple of years. And um, that also meant that they had to recruit a lot and that they really had to um, get more and more workforce because um, they were growing so fastly. And um, that's what, um, or where we came into play or when our project started. And, um, so um, I give you just a little history. So Promerit um, came into the game uh, in 2016. But beforehand, um, a lot happened as well. So I think it's interesting to know that uh, Infineon had 10 years, so from 2003 to 2014, no recruiting um, organization in-house. So they had everything outsourced, and um, they had uh, the hiring manager wrote the job ads. They had a 10-year-old career site, and an application took really long, so really 30 minutes time. And um, actually, it didn't work at all. So it was quite a nightmare. And um, they said, OK, we have to improve. We have to do th something. And what, then, what they did then is they um, installed a recruiting organization. And they said, we have to get the best people. Um, and we won't call them recruiter, but we will call them talent attraction manager. So because they wanted to show, hey, we are attractive for our um, talents. And that's why we name them talent attraction managers. And um, yeah, they actually did a lot. They uh, increased the application process for the applicants from 30 minutes to 90 seconds. So that was quite, quite good. And um, they developed uh, also a new career site. But um, it didn't work um, that perfectly as they thought in the beginning. They achieved um, better reputation. Yeah, that's true. But um, um, actually, the recruiters um, weren't able to recruit the talents they needed because they didn't have time. They were, yeah, stick to their um, typical um, um, applications they got. And that's when Pumerit came into um, the play. And you can see here. So what they did, they had like a one-fits-all approach. Like uh, when you have a watering can, you do everything for everyone, uh, and you think one-fits-all is perfect, but that didn't work. And um, that's where we came into the game, and we said, OK, we have to differentiate our approach. So um, as I said in the beginning, Infineon is in the semi semiconductor industry. So they are heading for uh, engineers, also IT people, but they also need some marketing people. And we said, OK, it would be really good to differentiate between these target groups. And um, we then set up a project. And um, our strategy consists um, of five elements. And um, I will go into more details um, in a second, and we'll give you some insights what, what we actually did. But I think the key message here is that we um, had an overarching um, strategy, so that we did a target group segmentation together with the business first. So we were really talking with the business, um, whom are you searching for? What workforce is needed in the future? What are the skills and the competencies? Um, and we um, then um, made um, implications to the process and to the roles. So that was the strategy piece. And um, what's really nice or what's the beauty about it is the second piece. So we 
did not just make some nice and fancy PowerPoint slides, but we also um, were, um, yeah, it was important for us to do something for the execution, to really enable the recruiters and to tell them what does that mean. How do you, um, how can we them? Where do we find them? And um, that's what we did in, uh, in the execution part. So um, we did some um, marketing persona. We also did uh, like a sourcing strategy um, and we also did a CRM system. So um, I will um, go into more details now, just the overarching frame and the overarching strategy. So um, the first part, um, I already mentioned, um, we um, really wanted to know which future talents um, is um, Infineon heading for. So whom do they need to be successful um, in the future time? So in the years, in the next two to five years, who are the relevant persons? And what skill set and what competences will be needed? And. Um, we, uh, what we did, so they di didn't have any strategic workforce planning in place, so uh, what we did was, was a three-step approach. So um, we talked first um, to the business, so we talked really to the strategy department and asked them these questions. So whom do you need? Where's the business um, heading to? So what are your future um, fields um, and what are maybe uh, no growth areas anymore? So we talked to the business first. Um, we then, secondly, um, talked also to the global HR business partners because they pretty uh, well know about the growth areas and they gave us some interesting insights as well. And the third piece was we also wanted to understand the labor market situation. So we wanted to know, yeah, is it easy or hard to get uh, the talent? So what is the labor market situation about? And therefore, we talked with the recruiters or the talent attraction managers and also the headhunters. Um, and um, the result of all these interviews and this analysis was the target group matrix you can see here on that slide. Um, so we um, really put together all the input we had, I and use that. Um, did that in this matrix. And as Same. you can see, um, there's um, on the one hand um, the business impact um, and on the other side the labor market availability. So it's technique <laughs> problems. Could you please? Yeah, you can do that. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, <laughs> good. Um, yeah, so um, as you, um, how you can see in the target group matrix, um, we had business impact on the one hand side and on the other side, labor market availability. And we clustered all the target groups. And um, the target groups you can see in the upper right corner, those are the key functions. So they are really important for the business um, for Infineon. So for instance, uh, digital people, but also software engineers. Um, and then they are really hard to get on the labor market. So it's really hard to find them. Um, and of course, there were uh, a lot of a lot more target groups. There were also some uh, in the um, in the left uh, um, quarter where when where the recruiters told us, yeah, it's really easy to get people like HR marketing, uh, like marketing. So um, yeah, they it was not only the critical functions, but here uh, we focused on the key functions. And um, uh, this matrix was really helpful um, for us for the further process because we now knew where Infineon is heading to and which talents they would need and which ones are really um, important ones. And um, actually, um, we also did some uh, lessons learned. So the um, approach was really, um, yeah, was really good to, to do it like in these th three steps and to do one-to-one -one interviews with the business um, because we did it another way with another customer. Uh, so we uh, did it in a common workshop. And what happened was that everybody, every business leader who sits in the workshop said, okay, my, ta my target group is really important and my target group should be uh, in the upper right quarter. So um, to avoid that, um, we, we did the one-to-one -one interviews and the interview partners were more uh, reflect, uh, reflective on that. So that's just a little side story. 
And yeah, and how did we get along with that? So now we have figured out which target groups or which key functions um, are available. And um, from that on, we um, made some implications to the f future recruiting process. So we said, um, in future, these key functions should be really relevant and should be, there should be enough time um, to source them. And we need some different approaches for those target groups who are easy to get. And um, what we did um, is we built a threefold product portfolio, as you can see on that slide. So we said there will be a, a really easy process uh, for target groups that are easy to get, like the central functions, like HR, like marketing. So for those target groups, we don't have to uh, we don't have to invest too much energy because post and pray really fits for them. So just posting a job ad is successful. So um, for those target groups. Um, we have, um, in terms of sourcing strategies, job posting, um, internal search, and employee referrals. Um, so, um, and the focus of that process really lies on the selection piece, to select the right people. Um, we then had a second product, um, and it was about uh, special and confidential target groups. So, of course, um, Infineon had also some executives to be recruited and some really special positions, um, like um, crypto security managers or the patent attorney, where they said, we are searching them just once in five years. So, it's okay for us if that's um, something for a headhunter. So, um, that was um, the second product and we said sourcing strategy here is really maybe to outsource these positions. And the third one, and probably most important one, is um, the network and sell process. So, and this, this process is really focusing on the key functions, the 12 key functions I showed you on the slide before. And uh, for them, as you can see, the sourcing strategy is really um, sophisticated. So um, we said for these target groups, the recruiters really should invest all of their energy and the resources really should be uh, put in here. And um, for those target groups, post and pray won't work anymore. So they really have to be proactive. Um, they have to be. They have to be like CRM events. They have to be campaigns. Um, you really have to go into direct search. Um, you have to do like alumni management with them, and so on. So for those target groups, um, Infineon really said, okay, we will invest um, in that strategy. And. Um, when we introduced that approach also to the business, because they wanted to know after the interviews, hey, what happened to our interviews? What were the results? They were really happy with that because they said, okay, now we have a differentiation and we know recruiting is not doing one fits all approach, but they are really differentiating and investing their energy where it's needed. So um, from a business standpoint, that was also really, really good. And the hiring managers also in the briefing dialogue pretty much uh, know then, hey, what will happen? What are the sourcing strategies? So um, that was the strategy part. And um, we, we then uh, really wanted to adapt also the, the roles because it didn't work. The 10 attraction managers weren't successful before 2016. And um, we then also redesigned the role description. And we said to be successful, um, the recruiters should be really should spend 50% of the time really for active sourcing and for network, network, networking and network maintenance. And um, what I also like about uh, the role description is that they also put in 10% uh, um, in innovation and strategy so that the recruiters, and we heard it today um, several times, the market is really evolving, new trends are coming up, and the recruiters also should have some time to be up to date and to, um, yeah, to be able to uh, follow the innovation piece. So I really like that part as well. And also 10% of the time should be spent uh, with the business because they said um, that the critical target group always wants to know the content, wants to know what is the job about, and the recruiters or the tenant attraction managers also have to be really into the business and into the, uh, the knowledge. So um, that's what we uh, did with the roles. And... Um, then we also said, okay, now we have our differentiated approach, 
but at the end of the day, we wanted, wanted to have like um, the, the target groups. We wanted to really fill the positions. We want to have the critical target groups. And um, that's what we did then in the execution piece. Um, we first of all created marketing personas. And um, we really talked to, um, so we did, did that for all the 12 um, key functions. And um, we really, went into some analysis and you can see it here a bit more um, a bit better so what we did we really asked the target group and we did that in our design thinking approach so really using a user-centric approach and talk to the target group and ask them about their preferences and ask them hey um, what are your preferences what do you like which benefits do you want to have what do you expect from an employer and what do you expect um, from your working experience and from your working environment. So um, we went into really um, a deep analysis and we also created um, some selling stories because um, these critical functions, they don't apply proactively. So you really have to sell the job for them. You really have to sell the purpose and the culture and you really make Infineon attractive for them. And um, that's, uh, we worked that out. So we really um, did some yeah, highlights. We did a complete selling story for these target groups. Um, and we also mentioned, of course, some lowlights because um, it, it's not, I think it's not, uh, good to only say, hey, it's really super cool, super good job. Uh, there are always some lowlights and it was important for us not to oversell, but also say what's maybe, yeah, um, uh, um, more or less negative or a low light. And uh, what we did um, as a third piece, we also um, analyzed um, the sourcing channels. So we really wanted to know how do we get these ta the target group? Where do we find them? Um, because they don't apply. So we have to go there and find them out there. And um, we um, did some research on that and we found really some very interesting channels like Stake Overflow, um, like, like Gollum um, and, and stuff like that. And um, the recruiters are now really using using these sourcing channels. And um, I think here's the beauty in it, what David uh, showed us. So I guess um, in future times, we also can combine that with the research you are doing. So okay. I think that's, um, that's pretty cool. And um, with these um, details, um, the recruiters had really good tool, uh, good, really good tool um, to go to the market and to proactively approach the candidates. And um, so um, with these marketing personas, we um, had a lot of content and um, we also brought this content now to life and we digitized uh, the content and we said, yeah, we have to really spread it um, so that the target group um, can find it. And um, we did some um, programmatic advertising, we did um, CEO campaigns, um, some mailings, um, also some uh, print ads, so really a multi channel approach to um, to go to the target group and to approach them with the right story and the right arguments I showed you before and um, what's really nice about it and I think you can have a look at it um, because um, they uh, did landing pages for all the 12 key functions so if you google Infineon the career page you can see that so they have really um, interesting stories um, about the critical functions because they said we really want to have them and when they come to our website we want to provide them relevant content so um, that was um, the yeah the marketing part and um, uh, evolving from that a lot of campaigns came up so um, we did like a high-tech after work event with the critical target groups and we provided also some nice materials so that was for the software developers and um, we developed that also together with the target group so it's not just an HR thing but um, it's to get, was developed together with the target group and they said like yeah it would be maybe it would be fun to have to see or not to see or hardware, software, casual wear. So um, they were quite creative with that. 
And um, very interesting, the results after three months was really an increase um, of the number of applications. So they had an increase of 40%. 40 um, and even more interesting, um, also um, the quality level was the same. Because um, you could see um, or you could imagine uh, it also could have been that there's... Um, yeah, some candidates interested in the campaigns and they like the flyer um, and the quality goes down, but that uh, wasn't the case. So that was really cool and also they had five times more visitors on their career side. And um, last but not least, um, we also um, introduced uh, a new CRM system. So Everture, um, maybe a few of you knows, uh, know them. Um, and that's a, a technology um, that can be used for keeping in touch with candidates. Because um, the candidates or the critical target groups um, do not want to uh, quit their job maybe immediately. Say, so hey, I'm happy in my job, I'm happy um, at Google, but maybe in looks interesting let's keep in touch for about two years and um, the software we implemented and all the concept around really helps to keep in touch and to um, keep the relationship so um, that was um, the fifth piece of our strategy and um, what's really cool, we also have some, some nice KPIs. Um, I think HR is not always good in, in KPIs um, and in numbers, but um, within that project, we also could prove the success of our project. And um, what we did um, is really we, we compared uh, the headhunter costs before our project and afterwards. And as you can see, um, in the year 2013 and 14, they, they had headhunter costs around 850,000 euros and afterwards um, they had like uh, really it really went down around 60 percent to uh, 187,000 and what's even more impressive uh, the number of um, positions they had to fill increased so um, they had only 300 around 300 uh, 2013 but had uh, but they had 1000 1600 um, afterwards so that was really double impressive um, and um, yeah so that was really really good good success and um, yeah uh, we also won won an award for that so we um, had an uh, we won the HR excellence award and um, what was really cool, um, um, the, the CEO of Infineon also messaged us during the, uh, the HR Excellence Award party and he texted, hey, it's a really good job and it's really important for the future of Infineon to recruit the right talents and to recruit the, the future talents with the right skills. And yeah, so that was really, really cool. And um, yeah, we, we were happy with that. And yeah, so um, that was was um, the story or the case um, I'd like to introduce to you and yeah we are happy to answer some questions and also to provide our presentation so thank you